Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. First up, check out Ben Dowsett's latest article on the website about lineup love, where they examine the Golden State Warriors. Another great line and terrific stuff going on over our .com. Really well written articles all over the place, so get over there and check it out. Well, now let's talk about the Lakers and what they're doing on offense. A lot of grief going around by how few threes they're taking. I think we're going to be able to explain why that is, but they're also running a whole ton of different sets. They got Princeton and Triangle and your basic high post and floppies. And the problem, I think, is that if you're going to run Triangle, you should run pure Triangle. If you're going to run Princeton, run pure Princeton. Instead, they're adding all sort of bits and pieces of it, and I don't think it works as well unless you commit to only one of them and breaking it down and focusing on that. And I think that's going to delay the offensive smoothness for months. Before we look at the actual sets the Lakers are running in their new offense, the amount of three-pointers the team has taken through three preseason games has been getting some attention. Last week, Byron Scott was quoted as saying he thinks taking somewhere between 10 to 15 three-point field goals a game is their target. If the Lakers split the difference and averaged 12 and a half three-point attempts per game, that would put them a full shot and a half behind the Grizzlies, who took the fewest three-pointers in the league last year. Looking at their roster, it seems clear to me why they've taken so few threes. One glance at their per game averages, and you can see there just aren't many shooters on this team. Surprisingly, Kobe is second on the current team in attempts, based on his average over the past four years. The problem is, he's way below average in three-point field goal percentage. Leading the team is Nick Young, who hasn't played more than 64 games in five seasons. His shot selection tends to fall into the, what is he, insane side of things, and his success rate is right around the league average. After that, you don't have what I consider any high volume knockdown shooters. While Steve Nash could be that guy, he doesn't appear ready to play many games, and he doesn't take that many threes anyway. While Wayne Ellington's average is good, he simply isn't proven as a reliable shooter in extended minutes. So, it isn't at all surprising that the Lakers don't have players comfortable shooting the three with much regularity. And if they averaged 15 threes a game, here's the historical context. Over the last 10 seasons, 68 teams have shot less than 15 three-point shots a game, and of that 68, only 10 won 50 or more games, which is most likely the threshold for playoff teams this year in the West. Now, let's dive into what they're doing on the court for offense. First up is the floppy set, where they have cutters getting pinned downs on either side. When the ball is initiated, the guard loosens up to the strong side corner before cutting to the weak side. This makes little sense to me, since he only serves to get in the way of the inside screen and roll action. Ellington doesn't look comfortable attacking with his left, so it becomes a dribble pitch and there are already some serious spacing issues here on the weak side before Ellington hits the 18-footer. Same play, same side, and watch how the weak side doesn't have much movement. Something seems off with Clarkson, who fakes a cut, and Ronnie Price shouldn't be invading his space. And here's why Coach Scott doesn't want too many threes, if Wayne Ellington is going to shoot them as a step back. They run the floppy to the other side, and we see this a lot in college now, where the weak side pin down gets a cross screen before he sprints to set the wing ball screen. This is good action because it can get the screener's defender out of the position. However, the screener doesn't roll hard to the rim, and they get a tough shot. They've got the usual high screen and roll set, but teams will simply ignore Jordan Hill, and with Boozer hanging out in the slot area, teams can pack the paint and take away easy buckets, especially with a stagnant set like this. Here, Boozer is confused by what they're running and ends up standing in the worst possible spot, where his defender can guard him and also erase the pick and roll action. While David Lee foolishly helps one pass away, leaving his man open for the layup, Boozer's attempts at the rim frequently are rushed, missed, or get blocked. Now, let's look at the fun stuff. Here's a two-guard front into a Princeton set with the high post. They run a UCLA cut into a clever double pin down for the weak side guard. After the dribble pitch, Nash still can't get into the lane, however, and he's forced to isolate and shoot a long, tough two. 
This appears to be the traditional chin series from the Princeton offense, but Wayne Ellington does a poor job both setting his man up and making the shuffle cut off the high post. Normally, the high post would flash at the elbow here. Look how much room he'd have. But instead, he sets the pin down for Ellington, who takes an ill-advised three on one of the best perimeter defenders in the game, and the Lakers need to force up a shot at the buzzer. Here's something more organized with the starters, as Nash makes the shuffle cut and Hill sets a flare screen for Kobe, who drifts for the worst shot in basketball. A shot with a foot on the three-point line. Details are always important, so watch how Ed Davis does not set the back screen for the first cutter. The flare cut wasn't open this time, so they swing it to Davis on top. This flows into floppy action and a good ball reversal that finds terrific post position for Julius Randle, who can't finish. The Lakers are also running a triangle offense, and here's the first look into the low post. Both the wing and corner speed cut and the best part of this action is the wing cutting through to screen for the weak side forward, which happens to be Kobe. This gets him a decent look, but he can't hit. The only issue is with Nash out on top. The real triangle calls for him to stay at the top of the circle, and when Kobe catches it, he cuts back door for a possible pitch to him and a shot. On this play, they dribble into the sideline triangle shape, and Randall does a good job rubbing off the screen and getting a shot. Again, the guard on top keeps wandering over too far. Same play, and you can't argue with the shot. This weak side screen is usually the hardest to teach, and they're executing that well. The second option of the triangle is pinch post, and after dribbling to the wing, the pass to the guard sets up a chain reaction. The weak side forward cuts to the weak side elbow, and if the guard doesn't get the ball back on the pitch, the forward is supposed to dribble along the free throw line for a handoff to the guard coming out of the corner. Randall doesn't seem to want to dribble with his right hand though, so opts to pitch back to Clarkson. The post up is fine here, but the spacing gets tight and he misses the face up. This is the traditional pinch post with Kobe coming off the elbow, but Wes Johnson falls asleep and doesn't accept Lynn's down screen where he should be coming out on top. Kobe hits a tough shot right in Clay's face anyway. The fourth option of the triangle is the pass from the forward to the corner, which triggers a back screen for the forward, and then a ball screen for the guard. They miss the back screen, and the weak side forward is supposed to screen for the strong side forward as he goes to the corner. The weak side falls apart, but Randall still gets a good look. They execute it much better here, but Sacre doesn't screen Iguodala like he should. One more dribble towards the baseline, and they could have generated a wide open three, the kind of look they're not getting nearly enough of. So there you have it, sports fans. New coach, lots of new players, team in flux. They're going to have a hard time getting this offense humming along smoothly with all the details you need to focus on that are not getting done, and I've shown you only a few of those. So I think that Byron Scott's going to have to wait until February until he can start to see what this offense is and what these guys can do out of it because there is a little bit of talent there here and there. The only problem is they're breaking down already with Steve Nash going down with injuries. So we'll see what happens. Stay tuned for lots more. Don't forget to head over to our .com for all those great articles. And also don't forget at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You win.